Well, most of us have heard of Leo Tolstoy, right? Leo Tolstoy? Okay. He was a great Russian novelist, and, and among his books are War and Peace and Anna, Korn- Anna Kar- Karenina. Some would even say that he is the greatest of all novelists. His writings have a, a moral force to them, and much of what he says is, is personally helpful. In spite of that, Tolstoy's morality was not God-centered. It was self-centered. In his book, Intellectuals, a historian named Paul Johnson tells us that Tolstoy defined God as the desire for universal welfare. And since Tolstoy saw himself as embodying that desire, he was God. Having defined God in that way, Tolstoy wrote in his diary. He said, help, Father, come and dwell within me. You already dwell within me. You are already me. Johnson wrote, he said, there were times when Tolstoy seemed to think of himself as God's brother. Indeed, God's older brother. Tolstoy once wrote this. He said, read a work on the literary characterization of genius today. And this awoke in me the conviction that I am a remarkable man, both as regards capacity and eagerness to work. I've not yet met a single man who was morally as good as I. I do not remember any instance in my life when I was not attracted to what is good and was not ready to sacrifice anything to it. Tolstoy felt in his own soul immeasurable grandeur. He saw himself as above the rest of humanity, as part of an apostolic succession of moral superiors that included the likes of Moses, Isaiah, Confucius, the early Greeks, Buddha, Socrates, Jesus, Pascal, and Spinoza. Tolstoy always felt a certain apartness from other men. However much he tried to sympathize and identify with them, he wasn't able to. In a curious way, he felt himself sitting in judgment over them, exercising moral jurisdiction. Now, perhaps, perhaps you've known people like that. People who thought they were just a cut above everybody else. People who thought that they had it all together and they looked down on everyone else. This morning, Jesus is going to be talking to some people that were like that. And at the same time, we're going to see that our prayer life reveals a lot about our position in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word this morning, Lord, I pray that, that, Father, you would be in the midst of it, that, Lord, you would open our hearts and open our minds, Father, to to hear from you. Lord, help us not to just think of this as about somebody else, but, Father, to see how we sometimes live this out. To understand how sometimes, Lord, we can be this, this Pharisee that we're going to be talking about. Father, help us. Show us, Lord, how we should pray. Show us, Lord, how we should live and how we should be with everyone around us, Lord. Father, we do thank you for your word. And Father, I pray that you would speak. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, uh, we are continuing our series on the stories of Jesus. And our scripture passage is going to be Luke chapter 18, uh, verses 9 through 14. In the Black Pew Bible in front of you, you'll find it on page 1038 if you're using one of those. Last week, we looked at the parable of the persistent widow and the unrighteous judge. That parable is just before this one. Literally, it backs up right to it. In Luke's gospel, it was, a, it was a parable that taught about prayer, that we should be persistent in our prayer because we know that God is gracious and loving. This morning, we're going to be looking at the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. 
It's also a parable about prayer. In this parable, we learn that prayer reveals where our heart is in relation to God and also what we think about ourselves. It's also a reminder that righteousness is granted by God, not by our works. We dare not succumb to the temptation of adopting an attitude of superiority and pride. So let's just get into it. Starting in verse 9, Luke just tells us who the audience is. This this is what Luke wrote. He said, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Now, Luke didn't specifically say that the parable was directed at the Pharisees. But certainly, they were in the audience, right? They were the ones that Jesus had earlier accused of justifying themselves in the eyes of men. And Jesus' reference to a Pharisee in the story suggests that they were the target audience. But what about us? I would say that the parable of the Pharisee and the the tax collector seems so simple that we often misread it. We think that it, it, it should bring comfort to our souls instead of the gracious discomfort that God intended. We've heard the parable of the the Pharisee and the tax collector so often that we dismiss it as being about other people, something that we really don't have to worry about. Actually, this parable should be both a comfort and a warning to us. So let's get into the parable itself, verses 10 through uh, uh, 13, 10 and 11, I think, or 10 is all I'm going to do first. Two men, uh, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So the story begins, begins very simply, right? Two people go up to the temple to pray. It just tells us who they are, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The temple was on the highest hill in Judea. And so whenever you went to the temple, you were going up. And that's a beautiful, beautiful image, isn't it? You know, going up to meet God. It was the religious, it was the political, it was the economic center of Jewish life. Really, it was the epicenter of worship and prayer. And there were two times of regular corporate prayer each day. They were built around the daily sacrifices, one at nine o'clock and one at three in the afternoon. And it was then that people from all over would gather together to offer prayers to God. But the temple was open all the time, not just at at those two times, for people to come for private prayer. And Jesus didn't say specifically whether these two men were there during the time for corporate prayer or the time for private prayer. But the fact that they were voicing individual prayers would seem to point that the fact that they came at a time when there wasn't a bunch of other people around. And they just happened to be there at the same time. And there was a stark contrast between these two men who came to the temple that day. One was a Pharisee. The other was a tax collector. Now, for us to understand uh, this, this, this story in the way that Jesus intended it, we need to take a step back. Because, see, we know who the Pharisees are, right? The Pharisees are the bad guys. They were Jesus' enemies. They were always out to get him. They were always looking for some way. They they were constantly causing problems for him. And they were the ones who ultimately pushed for his crucifixion. But to Jesus' audience that day, the Pharisees were the good guys. The Pharisees were the ones who lived a very upright life. According to the uh, Jewish historian Josephus, they were a body of Jews known for surpassing the others in observance of piety and exact interpretation of the laws. They were the most highly esteemed group in Israel. If you had a son, you would want him to become a Pharisee. If you had a daughter, you would hope that she would marry a Pharisee. They were the good guys. You could count on them to uphold the law, to love the law. They were the best of the best. 
So in order to read this parable properly, Through first century Jewish eyes, we have to start with a positive image and an expectation, a positive expectation for the Pharisee. When Jesus started this parable, he was the good guy. I mean, we just know he's going to be the hero in this story. On the other hand, we've got a tax collector. And the contrast is vivid. Tax collectors were the of Jewish society. Rome imposed taxes on the people that they conquered, but the collection of the taxes they left to private contractors who then employed, in, in the Israel's case, Jewish underlings to do the dirty work. And their pay was whatever extra they could get out of the people. They were considered monsters. In fact, some of them were monsters. They were religious and political traitors to the Jews. They were utterly despicable. They were not allowed to hold public office. They were barred from giving testimony in court. They were outcasts. They were untouchables. And they tended to live around each other in little societies because no one else wanted to be around them. They were as undesirable as lepers. And they tended to live in their own kind of leper colonies, except for the disease. In today's culture, the closest equivalent that I could think of would be drug pushers and pimps. Those who prey on society, who make their money off of other people's bodies, who make a living stealing from others. So there's this huge contrast between these two people who went up to the temple that day to pray. The mere thought of a tax collector going to the temple was jarring to the Israelites. So let's hear what they did. Let's start with the Pharisees' uh, prayer. Uh, Verses 10 and 11. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. So here we have the Pharisee. The Pharisee stands up to pray. And really, when you look at it, and you go back to the original, it kind of implies that he walked to the front of the temple grounds and raised his hands and began to pray. He wanted everybody to see him. He wanted everybody to know who he was. And his prayer began well enough. God, I thank you that I'm not not like all these other men, these robbers and adulterers, evildoers, this tax collector. I mean, he was appropriately grateful for what God had given him from. God had really what God had kept him from. He hadn't stolen from anyone. He'd been faithful to his wife. I mean, it's appropriate to thank God when you avoid serious sin in your life. To the Jewish listeners, even the inclusion of of even like this tax collector seemed appropriate. God, thanks for keeping me from falling into the awful sin of this evil man. You know, today, today we might word the prayer a little bit differently. God, I thank you that I haven't fallen into what so many people around me have. Sensuality and dishonest business practices. The wicked life of so many of the unchurched. You know, we ought to be thankful for God's grace in our lives. You know the old saying, there before the grace of God go I. But there's something wrong. Something wrong here. You know, he put himself into a very prominent place. You know, the tax collector, when we look at him in the the back, we see the, the Pharisee going to the front of the court of Israel. And the sense is he came in such a way to make everyone notice him. He entered the court of Israel and then he strutted up front and center as he approached the altar of the burnt offering. And he stood erect so that everybody could see him. 
And he raised his hands. And he, he moved so that the tassels on his robe would flow as he began his prayer. They could see the phylacteries on his forehead and on his wrists. And then he began to pray. Second, the prayer was loud enough for everybody in the court to hear. I mean, he didn't keep it to himself. He made sure that everybody knew he was there and that they heard his most eloquent prayer. And third, his prayer was self-absorbed. After his initial nod to God, what's essentially given here is a self-congratulatory monologue disguised as a prayer. Five times in two verses, he uses a personal pronoun, I. I thank you that I am not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give 10% of what I get. I, 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 I. And he parades his virtues before God and man. He goes above and beyond the requirements of the law. He fasts twice a week. The law only required to fast one day a year on the Day of Atonement. He ties 10% of everything that he gets, not just his income. Look at me, God. Look at me. Look how good I am. It's all about him. It's all about self. And fourth, you know, our discomfort with his prayer peaks when he drags the sleazy tax collector in in order to draw attention to his own Mr. Cleanness. His self-evaluation is, is based on the exposure of the moral failures of others. God, I'm not as bad as this guy. Even worse, he doesn't appear to care about the plight <clears throat> of the tax collector. See, the Pharisee has not been warmed by the love of God. His claim to be a lover, to, a lover of God is shown to be false by his lack of love for this poor, pitiful, sinning neighbor. A lot of people who profess to be Christians today make the same error as this self-righteous Pharisee. They thank God that they're not living sinful lives, and that's okay. That prayer is good in a restricted sense. Such prayers begin well enough thanking God for His saving grace that has changed their lives but they regard the living of, out of their lifestyle as due to their own discipline, their own effort. They've made the grace of God into some type of personal accomplishment. In, in the words of verse 9, they, they become confident in their own righteousness. And they look down on everyone else. Literally, that says they utterly despised the rest. Comparative side glances and, and, and lips pursed in disapproval reveal the terrible delusion that all is well within their self-righteous soul. A life that finds security in comparison to other people is deluded. It's utterly unbiblical. It's utterly... It's utterly false in, in its understanding. It's, it's so unlike Paul, who concluded about himself while he was contemplating uh, God's saving grace. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. In verse 13, we have the prayer of the tax collector. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So in contrast to the Pharisee's spiritual facade came this tax collector's pitiful prayer. 
And the contrast is intense. The Pharisee stood in the prominence of the court of Israel. And it says the tax collector stayed back. Really, just inside the gate. Just barely there. Not feeling as if he even deserved, <clears throat> excuse me, to be there. He's been banned from the synagogue. He's banned from society. He stands in the back. He doesn't presume that he is welcome in the presence of God. While the Pharisee stood proudly with his eyes open up to heaven, his, his hands outstretched, his palms turned up, trying to wait for the blessing that God is going to pour out on him. The tax collector can't even look up. He beats his breast with clenched fists. His heart is broken. Like the Pharisee, the tax collector verbalized his prayer, but what a difference. You see, <laughs> it's one thing to publicly announce your virtues. It's quite another thing to admit your sins. The tax collector had no desire to compare himself to the other man who was there, but merely cried out, God, forgive me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. And not a sinner, the way they translate it in the NIV, it is the sinner. I am everything that people say about me. And more. I will not attempt to make myself look better by comparing myself to someone else. I am the sinner. This wayward son of Abraham had been excluded from the synagogue. He'd been ostracized from the godly, but he knew where to go and he knew how to pray in his pitiful state. His plea, have mercy on me, is the opening line to Psalm 51. The, the great penitential psalm of David following his adultery and murder, where David repents and, and sings of God's forgiveness. The tax collector's hope was that just as God forgave David's heinous sins, he would forgive his monstrous treacheries as well. God, have mercy on me. God, be propitiated, propitiated to me, the sinner. Let your anger against my sin be removed. He knew that God's wrath was upon him. The merciful removal of God's anger was his only hope. So what opposites stood there to pray that day? Both the scum and the cream of Jewish society. One infamous for his sins, the other famous for his righteous lifestyle. One lowly and one self-assured. And Jesus then declared the meaning of his parable in verse 14. He said, I tell you that this man, that is the tax collector, rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The excellent Pharisee with his wide phylacteries and his long tassels, strode from the temple, day, temple that day, confident in his righteousness. Such a dramatic contrast with the unworthiness of 
the tax collector. I mean, he felt great. You know, but since he was standing on his own merits, the Pharisee left the temple unaccepted, unjustified, <laughs> and under God's wrath. But the tax collector, who had systematically made his money on the backs of his people, this traitor, this, this pariah, by having repented and having humbly cast himself on God's mercy, left the temple justified. And just like that, his sins were gone. In a flash, God's wrath <clears throat> was turned away. In an instant, he had new life. The great New Testament of Justif doctrine of justification by faith has its roots here in the teaching of Jesus. And that's what Luke wants us to see here. The doctrine was made possible by Jesus himself. Paul told us that now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You know, when it comes to relating to God, people only have two choices. They either, they can try to make themselves right with God by justifying their lives, or they can admit their inability and ask God for mercy. You know, every religion that has ever existed, except for Christianity, offers a plan for someone to try to earn their way, earn their favor of the deity of their religion. Philosophies do the same thing. Man simply cannot escape the internal desire for a moral compass. That's why we have laws and prisons and government. Even if someone claims that there is no God, they still feel a need to be justified, to be considered morally right and acceptable. So in the end, many people claim their own standard of morality. Their security is in comparing themselves to the morality of someone else. They think if they're better by comparison, that they'll take refuge in that. Or they seek to change the standard of morality so that what they're doing is not considered immoral. It's acceptable. The Pharisee pictured here isn't just hypocritical churchgoers, although they're definitely included. Jesus said here, notice this, that everyone who thinks this way God will bring down to judgment. That is all of humanity. Atheist, Buddhist, Muslim, communist, Democrat, Republican, Baptist, Catholic, homosexual, or heterosexual. It doesn't matter. Everyone who thinks that way will be brought to judgment. If anyone thinks that they are justified by their own standards, or they're justified by comparing themselves to someone else, then they're lost. They're without Christ. And they are doomed to hell in the judgment. See, nothing that we do is, is ever the basis of our acceptance with God. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And also that faith, like grace, is a gift from God. And, and as we look around and we see our society plummeting deeper and deeper into moral depravity, they attempt to redefine the moral standard of righteousness. And that's nothing new. It happened in the Old Testament, it happened in the New Testament, and it is happening today. 
In Romans 10, we read, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, that is their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. You know, we see various groups around us today trying to define their own standard of righteousness all the time. Some are loud and obvious. Groups that promote abortion. Groups that promote homosexuality. But so are those who want to have premarital sex. Those who commit adultery. Those who want to have non-biblical divorce. And so are those who want to give God a nod and say, hey, I came to church today. I'll check in with you again later. In the meantime, I got stuff to do. Living up to our own self-serving standards will never lead to salvation. The only way that anyone can uh, can be saved and declared righteous before God is to humble themselves and to repent of their sin. They need to recognize, or actually they have to recognize, that they are wrong and God is right. They have to recognize that they need to be changed and that God is the one who can change them. They must surrender everything to Jesus Christ and trust in his sacrifice for their sin. They must ask God to remove his wrath and by his grace to transform them. From the inside out. The only way. The only way. To be part of God's family. And to enter into his kingdom. Is to be absolutely dependent. On God's mercy. To receive his forgiveness. By confessing that. What God says in his word is sin. And that what one's heart. Has been wrong to think. And that one's heart has been wrong to think otherwise. Our right standing with God is founded on the mercy and the grace of God. Specifically the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. And this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate, that, to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. You can't do it by keeping the law. You can't do it by your Works. James wrote, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles on just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Is that a a message for people who aren't saved? No. You know, there are a lot of Christians who can be tempted to, as the scripture says, return to our vomit. To go back to the old way of thinking. To thank God that we're not living sinful lives like the others around us. But regard our lifestyles as a result of our self-discipline. Rather than the grace of God. We can be guilty of comparing ourselves to others inside the church and outside the church. And then justifying ourselves by our own self-made standard. Hey, I read my Bible more than other people do. I give more than others. I go to church more than others. You know, I don't commit some of the sins that my coworkers do. I don't believe in that evil stuff that our culture is preaching. Comparing yourself to others is a terrible delusion. And it's hiding self righteousness. 
The righteous heart's only hope for salvation. Their only hope of continued sanctification is the blood and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord often closed his parables with axioms. You know, with just these are just formal things that, that are fundamental. And he did here with how he closed this parable. He said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. This is rooted in the Old Testament. And it was repeated over and over and over again in Israel's history. It was restated at the very birth of Jesus when his mother Mary sang the Magnificat. She said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. Jesus spoke truly. He said, for everyone who humbles, exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Life and eternity will present us with surprising turnarounds and eternal reversals. This parable conveys some penetrating wisdom. The spiritual posture with which we pray in our heart of hearts reveals whether we have been made righteous by God. Though the unrighteous heart may never say it publicly, its prayers reveal to God that it's really depending on itself for eternal life. Though lip service may be given to humility and repentance, they're not real. The unrighteous heart subtly sees itself as a partner in one's own salvation. In their own goodness. You know, due perhaps to God's grace and their use of it. Their, their own goodness is held dear as the real source of salvation. Good people. Good people will be okay. Because they're not big time sinners. Such a heart is in for a terrible surprise. In contrast, the righteous heart is a heart that, whether just made righteous or having been justified decades earlier, says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. The righteous heart's only hope is in the blood and mercy of Jesus. So do you pray like the Pharisee, or like the tax collector. Eternity will tell. Because how we pray reveals our position in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. And Father, sometimes, Lord, it's, it's difficult to hear. It's difficult to preach, especially when you tell us the first thing we need to do is preach to ourselves. So, Father, I pray that you would forgive us for those times, Lord, when we do become self-righteous, when we do compare ourselves to others when really there's only one person that we should compare ourselves to, and that is Jesus Christ. And Lord, we all fall short there. So Lord, forgive us for that. And help us, Lord, to change. Help us to, to, to follow your word. Help us to live a life that glorifies you. Father, we can't do that. Not on our own. But we can only do it with you, with you guiding the way, with you leading us. Father, help us to follow. Father, I pray that, that Lord, if there's someone hearing this who has never accepted Jesus as their Savior, that, Father, even now you would be showing them the way to salvation. 
Father, help them to see Jesus Christ as their Savior, the one who came to die in their place. Lord, I do thank you for this, this story, this parable that Jesus told. Father, help us to live up to it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.